Today, we begin week four of the course, which discusses regional human rights systems. I think this is one of the most interesting and rapidly developing areas of international human rights law, and I look forward to discussing these issues with you. I want to begin by giving you some overarching questions to consider. So first is a very basic question. Why create regional human rights systems in the first place? We've now studied the UN human rights treaty bodies. We've looked at the UN charter mechanisms, such as the Commission and the Council. So we certainly have international monitoring and review mechanisms with regard to states' human rights commitments in treaties and also in customary international law. What value added, you might ask, are regional systems? Well, we'll explore that uh, question in a moment. A second question, to, uh, which will guide our discussion over the coming lectures, is what are the distinctive features of the three major regional human rights systems in Europe, the Americas, and Africa? These three systems were developed uh, at different times, Europe first, then the inter-American system, then the African Charter, now African Union system, and they have many similarities, but also quite a few differences, and we'll explore both the similarities and the differences. Finally, what are the prospects for regional or sub-regional human rights mechanisms in other parts of the world? This is an especially important question if you think that regional systems are more effective in the promotion and protection of human rights than are UN-based systems. Let's briefly discuss the first question, why create regional human rights systems? I want to suggest a number of answers to this question here, but I certainly invite you to think of others and to raise them in the discussion forums. So the first answer or potential answer to this question of why states create regional human rights systems is to address distinctive human rights issues, issues that are of special importance or particular concern within a given region. I've given you one example here in the African Charter of Human and People's Rights of the right of peoples to dis freely dispose of their wealth and natural resources. This does not appear uh, in the major covenants uh, of civil and political rights or economic and social and cultural rights, nor does it appear in the European or American systems. Other examples of uh, region-specific issues might be uh, female genital cutting in Africa, which is the subject of a special protocol to the African Charter, the forced disappearance of individuals that was first regulated in the Americas before becoming subject of a UN treaty, and the prohibition of capital punishment, which was first incorporated into an optional protocol to the European Convention before it was incorporated into an optional protocol to the ICCPR. So that's one reason, distinctive human rights issues at the regional level requiring a, a distinctive regional response. A second answer to this question is that states want to commit to higher or more stringent human rights standards than might be possible at the global level. So it might be that different countries with different legal systems, different uh, political traditions, different cultures might agree to a minimum baseline of human rights protections but regional systems, which might be more similar in, in, along those dimensions, could agree to higher standards. So that's another good reason for having a regional human rights system. A third reason, and I think perhaps one of the most important, is to create stronger monitoring and enforcement mechanisms, such as an international court and an international commission. We haven't seen yet in this course any international human rights courts and we don't have any, and I don't think we're likely to see any for the foreseeable future at the global level. We do, however, have three regional human rights courts uh, in Africa, the Americas, and in Europe. And one question that we'll ask is what kinds of activities do these courts perform, what sort of cases do they hear, and what sort of influence do they have on the behavior of the member states in that region? A final answer to the question of why create regional human rights systems is because they uh, are a product of greater political will for the protection and promotion of human rights than might be available at the global level. And that political will for compliance might come from domestic interest groups, voters, etc., within a state who favor human rights compliance at home and abroad, and also regionally. 
uh, a form of peer pressure from other governments in the region who think either for instrumental or moral or other reasons that the protection of human rights within a particular region is desirable as a policy matter and as a legal matter. So that's those in brief are four answers to the question of why create regional human rights systems. We'll discuss m these questions in more depth as we proceed through the materials this week. Let me give you a very quick overview of the lectures for this coming week. We'll have two lectures on the European human rights system and the European Court of Human Rights, two lectures on the Inter-American human rights system and its court, and also two lectures on the African human rights system and its much more recently created and much more recently functioning Court of Human and People's Rights. We'll conclude the week with a brief discussion of sub-regional systems in Africa and also uh, in Asia. I'll leave you with one source for additional information about regional human rights systems, which you might care to examine before continuing with the remaining lectures this week.